there's not many people grow corn where I'm from. They grow sweet corn, maybe for a meal or stuff, but the stuff that I'm growing is, I believe it's called Red Lake Flint. So I believe it came on the migration from the St. Lawrence Seaway where we were originally from. Before we moved on our migration to find where the food grows on the water. That's where, that's where we're at now, where the food grows on the water. Well, prophecies, following prophecies to get to that land. We've had corn for a couple thousand years. I think it's called Tema Flint, among other names. We've grown it for a long, long time. corn growers from all over the Midwest to come to our community and learn about our way of taking care of white corn. We also invited people who had more experience growing corn than we did so that we could learn from them and share their knowledge with other folks that are interested in growing corn, all varieties of Indian corn. So I spoke with uh, about 25 white corn growers in our community and I asked them specific questions about what size acreage they were dealing with, what were some of the um, things that they were using to improve their soil health, were they using kind of fertilizers, were they using mechanical tools, or were they doing um, everything with hand operation. And through that I discovered that um, the operations are really small and everyone seems to be struggling with the same thing of too many weeds. Um, not enough fertilizer, poor soil health, and then the, their crop is stunted. And, and they didn't know what to do about it. They didn't know who to ask. So we decided to form a group, a white corn growers group. And we started growing together on a, on a three and a half acre field. What we're hoping to do is talk with farmers who have grown up growing white corn, who have lived with it and have a real special relationship with the corn so they can teach us um, all the things to watch for during the season, how to take care of it, um, if something should happen, what could we do to remedy the situation. So we're really like sponges, we want to absorb as much knowledge as we can and at the same time encourage other people that are first time growers to come along with us. It's going to be a tough journey but it'll be worth it in the end. This particular corn that we're growing is called Iroquois white corn and it's about 110 day corn which takes a full season where we are. We're in region five and kind of the upper half of Wisconsin. So we have to jump in early and, and wait until it's pretty chilly before we harvest it right about now, October. So we're excited about the, the possibility of having a plentiful crop this year. It's the first time that we as a, a group of homeowners or just private citizens went together and said, I think we can do this. I think we can grow our own corn on a little bit larger scale so we can have enough to give away to some of our neighbors. So we took on three acres and that's where we are today. We grow Iroquois white corn. It's um, a corn that we are currently growing right now and harvesting today. It's um, not like a sweet corn that a lot of people think about when they think of corn, nor is it a field corn that you'd feed to animals. It's a corn that we use for not only our ceremonies, but also we try to incorporate it in our daily diet. I grew up as a young boy growing corn. Um, as far as I can remember, I was in the garden with my parents. In my later years, my father took sick and one of the few things, one of the last few things that he had told me before he passed on was to keep the seeds going and that was the initial reason why I decided to keep planting and keep keep the corn alive as well as the beans and the squash seeds that he had. 
that these seeds were sacred, that we, we had to keep these seeds going for our future generations. And so I decided to keep them going, and I knew that they were part of our ceremonies, that we had to use these corns, as well as the health benefits of them, of eating them, going back to our traditional foods. So I decided to keep growing corn. I pretty much only grow that one corn. It's the only one I have. Well, I have other ones, but I have yet to try them. What? But I've been growing this variety for 30, 40 years or better. Somewhere around there, I've lost track of how long it's been. But it's I have to do it every year since I have started doing this. That's how ingrained it is. And Grandpa grew it, Auntie grew it. You know, a lot of people grew it before, but then it got kind of lost. Nobody had the seed no more. Or I'm very particular about who I give seed to. I do eventually want it to be given all to everyone who wants to do that, do the corn and stuff. That, this gathering was a good chance for me to to do to do what I you know, intend to do. Well, to us, corn, corn is what we call life because as a people you got to remember us Indians have been on this continent for thousands of years my tribe like most tribes were Macedon hunters we only ate big animals but life changed climate changed and we lost those big animals and we've always said our Creator loves us and will take care of us and when that happened we received corn, squash and beans and we became hunters and farmers. We had a village, a summer village and where we would plant our crops in the fall we would around about this time we would go to our winter camps and hunt and trap. Then come back in the spring, fix up the summer village and plant our crops again. And that cycle of life has continued on. And as a tribe, we're, we're very lucky that we still follow somewhat our seasonal life cycle. We just finished harvesting our crops and now as a tribe we're settling down for winter we're geared to that to make enough corn to last three months that's winter time you have to have enough corn to to live because of our environment the northeast corner of the United States the no what's called the northeast is uh, what you would call a, a bioregion and we have lived in this bioregion for thousands of years where our habits, everything, our religion, our customs are geared to live within this environment and corn has become a very big segment of that lifestyle we have. We're corn people. I hand pollinate my corn because I grew it for seed, not to eat. I just wanted to have enough seed. Sometimes people would hand me only a small handful of seed and I had to make sure that that little bunch of seed that I had in my hand um, was pure so that then I could hand it on to someone else. So I plant uh, one circle with a certain kind of corn, like uh, a blue corn from the southwest. Another circle right next to it may have, um, I got gifted one ear, and I'm very careful with it, of Dakota corn. Uh, I have another of Lakota popcorn. Um, and some of that blue corn that they plant in the southwest has a good five-foot root system because they don't have water and the, root, the corn has acclimated itself to that area. And that's why corn has lasted 
um, so long. Well, when it started in Mexico and it made its way north, um, the Arikara say they're Mexican. They're part of the three affiliated tribes. And when they began their journey, their medicine people said, um, we have to keep moving north. We have to uh, spread the word of corn. And that's what they did um, wherever they went. Uh, and right now, I think they're up in um, either Wyoming or North Dakota. Um, but wherever that corn went, the husk itself, when it's a dry climate, the husk grows loose around the ear. Up this way, because it's so humid, the husk grows really tight because it doesn't want the humidity to come in. We have chosen the Oneida name Wealatu. And that's uh, people among the corn. I think that's what it is, it translated. But it really comes down to uh, the group who have a relationship and a friendship that centers around agriculture and growing corn. That's the kind of group we are. Farming is just a walking pace. You just gotta keep walking, get things done, keep, keep at it. And th those become very important. It's a season. I start now and I have faith that by fall, I'll be able to unwrap something that's beautiful and it's a corn cob that's grown and uh, it gives us patience. The current group of people that came together to grow this corn all contributed corn to be planted this last season. So we're harvesting uh, probably 12 sources of corn were mixed together. So the diversity was, was promising. And now we have, a, we have an abundance where we can save enough seed to pl replenish what we're going to do and possibly some other people in the community if they're seeking seed quality. So we're excited about the, just the abundance of it all to have enough to share, to share. It's such a blessing to give than to receive, to have that opportunity to have enough to give to somebody. Some guy from here in Seymour. Our group is called Ohelagu, and what that means is we stand among the corn stalks. So while the corn is the most important part of that word, we stand with it, meaning that it has the support of the people. Some of the memories that I have of corn is growing up eating corn soup, uh, corn mush, um, corn bread, like Gunna Stohal. I remember it not being very common to have um, it around here we would just usually have it for special occasions and I remember when I went down to school I went to College of Madison my husband and I and we didn't have access to the corn when we were there we could bring some down with us but we didn't necessarily come home all that often and I remember just really wanting to have some corn soup and we went to the grocery store and bought hominy and tried to make our corn soup that way and it just made us more homesick. So it's nice that now that we're home and not only is our nation growing more corn but more families and more groups are trying to grow white corn to make it more available for people to not just have corn, our white corn during our ceremonies or during special occasions but just to have it on a regular basis to incorporate into our diets. One of the biggest challenges we have is cross-pollination with other strands of corn that are out there. In this area, it's mostly the sweet corn and the field corn that's meant for the animals. Um, we don't know what's in the seed or how that seed came about for our neighboring corn fields. Um, and if that gets into our corn, it can threaten the integrity of our corn. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are talking about GMOs and the farmers in this community. Um, the big farmers are using GMO corn and that has the potential to carry on the wind and come into our white corn fields. So we have to be very careful where we plant our white corn and even though our reservation is very large and even though we have a lot of egg land, there's not a whole lot of places here that we can even grow our white corn without it being threatened from the neighboring corn. Primarily, we just have to limit ourselves to where we grow our corn, where um, probably where there's a lot of trees that will buffer the, our corn from the neighboring corn. Um, I've also heard of people putting bags over their corn tassels to prevent cross-pollination, but I don't, I, we've never tried it. Um, I hope it doesn't come to that where we'd have to do something like that.
Um, and we just also distance and buffers are the two biggest things that we do to protect our corn from the GMO corn that the other farmers grow in the area. The GMO corn is the biggest threat of all to us. We live in an area that is surrounded by GMO corn growers. And, and that's a really big threat because our corn is open pollinated. All our heritage corn is open pollinated. And if it crosses, our corn will suffer from that. It'll get weak. So we try as much as possible to keep our corn separate, away from GMO fields, any other type of uh, pesticide fields or spraying, any of the chemical stuff like that. We just, all we do is plant right in the ground, no fertilizers or anything like that. We do our organic composting, but that's, that's the only thing that we really have to do at this point with our ground. We know the geography of our territory, so we know our wind directions. Uh, we know where what fields we can plant that are isolated. So we keep that all in mind. We have a little map of our territory where we know where we can plant corn safely that is away from GMO fields. And that's what we do to try to protect that. We started out um, just growing corn and donating corn to our ceremonies and to the people who need ceremonies. Um, and all the corn that we grow now it goes back to all our people. So anybody that needs corn, we're giving the corn back to them. We grow it, harvest it, take care of it, give it back to them. The Council of Chiefs seen that we were doing this and supported us in this. It's been uh, something that they've talked about for years of putting food away and uh, going back to our original corns, using them, putting it back into our diet. So they support what we're doing, our, our, um, our farming projects, um, as well as um, they sanctioned us to have a new place to prepare the corn, which is our, the corn crib that I helped um, construct. The corn is a grass and it cannot grow by itself. It needs the help of the people to make it healthy. The people cannot grow without the corn. They need the corn to make them healthy. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Our biggest threat is contamination to our traditional corn. That's our biggest threat. I think they call it GMO corn and genetically modified corn. That's our biggest threat. It's not losing our corn. It's not our biggest threat because we'll always we'll always grow corn. But to keep it as our Indian corn is our biggest threat from our white neighbors that grow corn commercially. We live in Iowa. We understand that our white neighbors that's their life lifestyle their life's blood, you know, to grow their type of corn, but it's not our type of corn. We got to protect our, our corn from that contamination. It ended up that corn has been in my path all that time, but I had always taken another fork in the road. And um, when, as you walk your road and you wonder to yourself, what, what am I supposed to be doing? We all ask ourselves that. Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I walking the road that <coughs> makes me happy? And as you live through life, that um, fork in the road is always going to be in front of you. And you can either choose uh, the road the spirits sent you here for or choose that other road. I knew that I had to take that other fork in the road, the reason why uh, my spirit came down to this earth and pass on, distribute, however you want to call it, uh, the corn seeds, the corn stories, 
um, my display of corn is something that you need to see and it explains the whole story of corn and how it started from little vials of teosente uh, the seed there uh, the people in Mexico looked at and said let's see what we can do with this and uh, I knew that it was time to take that corn fork in the road and learn from other people. That, that's how it first started is um, other tribes coming and saying, I, I hear you carry corn, I want you to carry our corn story. And I hand them tobacco and I said, okay. They hand me tobacco, we hand tobacco back and forth it's for it to be a, a good way for the corn stories to keep going. And if I see the seed as truth, and plant it in my heart. I want to be fertile ground so that I grow and the fruit from my life, joy, love, patience. I was a missionary for 16 years all across the United States, Europe, Turkey, Greece, Italy. And to have any food together with a family that loves to share and is generous and expresses not just you being a guest, but by their expression of hospitality, they communicate that you are now part of their family because you've shared at this table. So to be able to share this food, this culturally significant food at a table with somebody and let them know that you are now family, you can always come here and stay with us. This is now your home too, because you've shared with us. Last year, we planted corn, but it didn't come in very nice. Um, we were very new, we didn't really know what to expect, and we were accustomed to the um, type of gardening where you don't have to necessarily be out there all the time, um, and we didn't get a very good yield that year. But this past summer, we were out there almost on a daily basis. We were weeding regularly, we were singing to the corn, we were talking to the corn, um, and our corn came out very nice this year. So what you put into it is what you get out. And the biggest lesson that I've learned is if you take care of the corn, the corn will take care of you. Some people have, have decided that they can stand up to GMOs and, and stand up to government and stand up to bad U.S. policy for Native people by growing their own food and choosing where to spend their dollar at the grocery store. They're fighting the way that the commercialism of food is or, or the way that uh, the seeds are being abused by you know, big seed companies. They can start growing seeds and, and sharing seeds with other people and that builds up a line of defense to help protect the sacredness of the corn. First of all, the first corn that we take, a, take out of the harvest is the corn for the ceremonies that we put, we put that aside first. Um, we put some corn into storage for future use and then there's corn for um, personal ceremonies, people with personal ceremonies and then we also, um, a part of the corn that we use just for eating during certain events, gatherings, whatever comes to our community, um, some of the women will prepare the corn and so that everybody gets a piece of it, everybody gets a share in the harvest by us giving that corn to them at them particular times so it could be shared among everyone. Mohawk people doing a seed exchange probably around 25 years ago and it was just small and, and we just exchanged seeds among each other and uh, later on it kind of grew, it started to grow this seed exchange thing doing seed trades for corn, squash, beans, and it was all our old, our old Iroquois seed. So later on I got involved in a bigger network of uh, seed keepers and seed exchangers and I started expanding out from our territory, the Haudenosaunee territory, and found that there were other nations actually involved in trying to promote their seed, growing up their seed, keeping their seeds. Um, and I got talking to those kind of people and I started actually trading seeds with different nations, their seeds and our seeds. And uh, I thought that was a really 
great thing that was happening because we started doing food exchanges as a spur of that. And once that started, it just kind of snowballed into all these other things that we're involved in now with uh, speaking about the corn, um, doing the seed exchanges, promoting the uh, traditional foods, our own traditional foods, as well as learning their traditional foods, how they pre prepare their food, how they uh, plant their seed, what they do to keep their seed uh, viable for the next planting season. So I've learned quite a bit from other nations and then I've shared my knowledge with them as well. Uh, it's good to see people are bringing, bringing this back and it's a good feeling to know there's people out there that are just as concerned about it as I am. Mm -hmm. When you grow a garden, I tell people it's like a little child. You gotta, you gotta nurture that child. You have to do the same with your corn. You gotta take care of it. You gotta weed it. You know, you gotta put tobacco in your garden when you get done planting, and then when you harvest too, you you gotta put your tobacco out to thank the Creator and the spirits for either giving you a good garden or. Your garden doesn't turn out right, you know, you gotta figure out well, what they do wrong. They do something wrong. But it's like a child. You have to you have to treat that teach that child right from wrong. And when you're working in your cornfields, it's the same. It's the same it's similar, it's the same thing. You gotta treat your corn right. I don't water my gardens. I hill them up and stuff to keep them strong from getting blown over or anything in the windstorms or whatnot, you know. Keep the corn from touching the ground so it doesn't get moldy or get wet or anything. I hang my corn up for two months once I harvest. I let it dry out, a lot of water in it. And November, it should be dried out. Then I can take the corn off there and I'll take my seed out there. Maybe fill up two or three coffee, coffee can fulls for my seed and then I'll mark it. Number one seed, 2012, 2014, whatever, you know. The lessons that corn has taught me is that you have to work to survive. You have to treat your your land good. You have to you have to keep your environment healthy. Because if your environment dies, you die. You you die as a people, you die as a civilization and you disappear if your environment is not good and one indicator with us is our corn no matter what happens but if economics comes depression or whatever you know movement of food stops we can always grow our corn and we can survive but if we can't grow our corn and our corn won't grow then we can't survive. So it all comes back to environment, to protect our environment, to be healthy. Because without a healthy environment, you, you disappear. You, know, you disappear from the earth. And there's been a lot of civilizations, great civilizations that have disappeared because of their environment was destroyed. I get great satisfaction out of just growing corn. Um, one of the best things I like to do is actually during harvest time is to open it up. Another part that I like is when I plant it and I actually see the plant start to come up. It's just, it's just some spiritual feeling that I have.
to see the corn come up. I keep thinking like how the Creator, as well as the Mother Earth here, helped us you know, in, a, in a way to sustain ourselves. And by planting corn, or our three sisters, how magical that really is. So the spiritual connection with me and, and my planting uh, is, is really deep down in my heart. Uh, since I've been planting as a young child or young boy, once you eat the corn and, and eat your own beans and eat your own uh, harvest, the satisfaction from that is unbelievable. There's times where we have meals that are totally, totally from our harvest, whether it's foraging, hunting, or the garden. We actually eat a whole meal at times that doesn't require anything from the outside. So it's basically um, a sovereign meal or a sustainable meal that we eat. And we just love that. And we're trying to add that back into our diet more and more and more. If we can get it in three times a week, you know, we're making a big step towards changing this um, colonial type of lifestyle that we've been um, programmed to eat, which is poison. Their food is poison to us. It's making our bodies sick and, uh, you know, diabetes is a big thing in our community. And I just think that if we can get the children back to it, our kids involved, you know, and show them, you know, that this is this is how we're supposed to live. This is how we're supposed to eat, and you'll grow up healthy, and we won't have problems, and we won't need the medicines from the white man or the doctor and stuff like that because the food is the medicine. And I think that's a very important lesson that everybody should know. When we have these gatherings, it's just astounding to hear people's stories and. and and different methods of planting and uh, what they do with their corn, you know, and we're learning new things all the time, different recipes, and it's, it's just, uh, just something that I think people are missing out on if they're not involved in this. If we could get all our nations back together and take their seeds and, and promote them within ourselves, regrow them, make the seeds strong again, and share them with our people, I think we'll be a lot healthier people getting back to the way that we should be. As long as you have corn, we can, we as a people that use corn, that eat corn. I, I understand not all tribes eat corn. Some tribes just don't in their culture. But to us corn people, we should protect our corn sources. The first individual is each tribe has its own, it's all corn, but each tribe has its own type. They should love whatever they type they have, just like with us. Us Meskwakis, we have our, our own corn. The lesson about this, our corn that we grow, is that we are hoping to find something that's so nutritional that it it honors our body our minds and our spirit so that we our quality of life will be better because of the the care that we take in the preparation of our food to protect this this body and try to make it healthy so it it affects our minds and our spirits too so to me it's it's all wrapped up into uh, ethical agriculture doing the best practices you can you can know about and trying them out and and watching your food grow and then and then being able to prepare it and share it with somebody if it's just your family or your extended family or or somebody from some strange place in California well, I think it's great to reach out to each other. So I know there's a lot more corn growers, even in our own community here in Oneida, that didn't necessarily hear about this event. Um, we need to do a better job to get the message out to those folks so that they can you know, stay in contact with us and we can learn from each other. The folks that came from Onondaga have taught us so much in just these past couple days. And you want to learn about corn.
So what our goals are is to host this event again for another four years and each one of those times invite people back to our community so we can continue the conversation, so we can show the improvement that we've made in our yield and so we can share what we've learned with other people.